Yo, para cambiar o variar un poco, voy a hablar en inglés y así ahorramos un poco de tiempo. Y también entiendo que hay pocos, pero hay algunos estudiantes que no hablan español bien, así es más fácil para ellos. I was asked to talk about particle physics more from the theoretical side and to give an introduction to this topic. And uh, normally when you give such a talk, you give it to particle physicists or you give it to physicists. But here I understand we are a group of all kind of uh, students from the university. And I have to admit it's a bit difficult to really judge what is easy to understand and what is not easy to understand. I try to put everything in very simple and easy terms. I hope I manage. If not, don't be afraid to ask. But usually people are afraid, more too, too much afraid to ask. We will see. And as I said, this will not only be an introduction, it also will tell you more about how one does this work from the theoretical side. So from the four people who will talk today, the first one, Alberto Ruiz, and the other two will come afterwards, they are experimental particle physicists, whereas I'm a theoretical particle physicist. But as I will also try to explain to you, in order to advance science, in order to advance knowledge, we all have to work hand in hand. Nobody can do it alone. First, I want to show you a little bit what is elementary particle physics. Then I will briefly wrap up what we know about our world. This was briefly mentioned in the previous introduction already, but I try to go a bit more into the details here. And then I will tell you how it really works with theoretical elementary particle physics. And if I have time, I have two slides about what we think might be beyond our current knowledge and how to explore it. Elementary particle physics investigates the inner structure of matter, the smallest building blocks that there are, and the fundamental forces acting among these fundamental particles. And the goal is to find the smallest structure of matter and the most basic laws of nature. And this, these were also the reasons why I got interested in this, yeah? For me, this was the most basic concept that we can find on Earth, and this was what attracted me when I was young. It still attracts me, but this was what, what brought me into this field. And from a historical point of view, in the 19th century, people were investigating chemical bindings and discovered the elements. They looked at crystals and molecules and discovered the atoms, and this uh, culminated in the periodic system of the elements. And later on, in the 20th century, one found that atoms actually are composed of a nucleus and a shell, composed of electrons. And the nucleus itself is composed of two types of building blocks called protons and neutrons. And I will talk about them later a bit. And even later, one found that this was still not the basic building blocks. One can find one more. The protons and neutrons are composed of quarks. And so in magenta here, you can see what currently is considered the most uh, fundamental building blocks of nature. You may ask yourself, how can we find out about this? How can we look into a nucleus or into a proton? How can we find out what's inside a proton? And just to give you an idea how this was done or how this kind of experiments can work in principle, I uh, drew this little cartoon here. You can imagine if this is the proton and you don't know what's inside, you take smaller objects. And we know, or we believe to know, that the electrons are point-like objects. And then you shoot these electrons into a proton. And you, then these electrons are kind of deflected. And you can measure in which way they are deflected, in which angles they are deflected. And from these measurements, you can find out about the inner structure of the proton, as an example. And in this way, people found out that the proton is mainly composed out of three objects and they were called quarks. And then you do more detailed experiments and you found, find out more about the characteristics of these building blocks, yeah? What is their electric charge and so on? How do they behave uh, with respect to each other? All this can be found out in this type of experiments. I told you there are two branches of, these, of the science, theory and experiment, and I will try to explain a little bit what is the difference between the two of them. From the theoretical side, 
we search for models or master formula, and I will come back to this later, yeah, that describe our world. And a model is what I call a mathematical formulation of the laws of nature. And I will show you one example later on. And once you have a model or once you guess a model, then you have to make predictions, yeah? Uh, predictions within this model. And predictions are, for example, how do the electrons behave, how they are deflected. This is one type of prediction you can make. Or you try to predict masses of elementary particles or other characteristics of these elementary particles. This can all be calculated within this mathematical formulation. And then there is the other side, the experimentalists, and they do the experiments to find new particles or to measure exactly these deviations, these structures, the mass of these particles, and so on. Yeah? And to find the basic laws of nature, the most fundamental structure of matter, you have to compare, you have to compare the theoretical predictions of a model with the experimental results. Yeah? This is the, the clue, the most crucial point here. So as I said before, theory and experiments have to work hand in hand in order to advance science. So what do we know about our world? From 19th century, we know that there are about 100 elements. I told you the elements consist of the atomic nuclei and the electrons, which have a negative charge. The atomic nucleus consists of protons, positively charged, and neutrons, which are neutral. Later, one found out, as I told you, that these protons and neutrons are made out of quarks, and one found that there are two types of quarks. They are called U and D, up and down, they are just names. And one found that the up quark has an electrical charge of two-third, so not a full unit, but a fractional unit, two-third. And a D quark has the charge minus one-third. And so even with this, you can find out how the proton and how the neutron is made up. We know the proton must have two U quarks and one D quark because it's positively charged, so we need two-thirds plus two-thirds minus one-third is plus one. And the neutron must be composed out of one U and two D quarks where the charge adds up to zero. And all our matter that we know, U here, the campus, everything is composed out of three building blocks. U quarks, D quarks, and electrons, nothing more. So it looks pretty simple. However, then people found out there's more that makes everything more complicated. And I will talk about this now briefly. There are additional Meta particles, particles like this, which are instable, they do not exist for a long time, only for a short time, and then they uh, disappear and decay to other, to stable particles. There are the so-called force particles, which are responsible for the forces between the meta particles. I will show you the examples. And there is the famous or infamous Higgs particle, which half of the particle physics community is looking for. So first, the instable matter particles. In the first row, you can see what I told you about. Quarks and the electron, which is the type is called lepton, just another name. And one found out there must be, for consistency, there must be another particle which is similar to the electron, but without electric charge. Otherwise, one could not describe the experimental data already many, many years ago. And one predicted the so-called neutrino, which is basically massless, has zero charge, and one knows now that this neutrino exists, and every second billions and billions of neutrino produced by the sun go right through your body without you noticing, because it has no charge, it uh, goes with basically light speed, and you simply don't notice. This is what we call the first family. So these three are really needed in order to describe the matter, and then these additional one. However, people found out that there are more of these particles and they are simply come in what we call more families. And the, ma the main characteristic of these particles is they are heavier than the first family, but otherwise they are the same. So heavier means they have more mass. They weigh more, or you need more energy to produce them. There are these two more quarks, S and C, and the muon, which is something like 200 times heavier than the electron, and another neutrino, which again is basically massless. And the third family, two more quarks, the B and the T, or the bottom and the top, and another heavier brother of the electron called tau and another neutrino. And the top quark, for example, here, was one of the latest particles discovered in 95 in the United States. That was 
seen for the first time experimentally. So in total, all these metaparticles are made out of six quarks and six leptons here. And this, oops, no, not now. And what happens if you produce one of these heavier particles? Well, they live for a very short time, and then they disintegrate, they decay to lighter particles. And I wrote here one example. You produce a muon, no matter how, you produce a muon, and then within a fraction of a second, it decays to an electron and two neutrinos. The neutrinos, they disappear undetected, but you, you stay with the electron here. And so the heavier particle disappears to two basically massless ones and the electron, which is stable. But there's more. There are the so-called force particles. We know that in our world, there are four fundamental forces. Maybe let's, uh, let's start with the fourth one here, which is the, the simplest one. Everybody knows it, the gravitational force. Yeah, we know gravity exists. And which is for respons uh, responsible for the apples falling. I will show you one example in a moment, or that the Earth circulates around the sun. And there are three more forces that really describe how the elementary particles interact with each other. The first one is probably also quite well known, the electromagnetic force, or light, yeah? Or how particles with electric charge interact with each other, that two negatively charged particles deflect each other, that a positive and a negative article attract each other. This is mediated, I will show you how this works, uh, via the electromagnetic force. And then there are two more forces that are needed to describe all what we saw, the experimental data that we have, the experiments that we did. There is the so-called weak force, which is responsible for the decay of um, subatomic particles, for example, a neutron, rapidly decays into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. This is a very typical decay. And here, the weak force is responsible for this kind of decay. And finally, there's the strong force, which keeps the atomic nucleus together. I will show you one example in a moment and explain why we really need it. But these are the four forces that we know. And I said force is always the exchange of one force particle between metaparticles. And if you look at this decay here, Neutrino goes to proton, electron, neutrino. Here we have a neutrino, which goes to proton. And then here, we have one of these force particles. And then the force particle itself decays into the neutrino and the electron. This is how we think it really works in the most basic way in nature. Yeah? So the force here is carried by the so-called W particle. What are these four force particles that we need? Well, for the electromagnetic force, the photon is responsible. Yeah? The coupling of one charge to another charge is uh, mediated by the exchange of a photon. The weak force, we have three particles that have been seen experimentally, the W plus, the W minus, and a neutral called Z. We've seen this on the previous slide. The strong force, I told you that the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons, and all the protons are positively charged. Why doesn't the nucleus explode? All the positive charges repel each other, yeah? But this doesn't happen. And the reason is that they are glued together with another force that is stronger than the ele electromagnetic force. Therefore, it's called the strong force, which is mediated by one particle called the gluon, which glues everything together. And for example, here it shows how these two U quarks and the one D quark are kept together inside the proton. And finally, the gravitational force here, which is mediated by the predicted graviton. They have not been seen yet, but people believe that they exist, and they're responsible for apples falling on physicists sometimes. So this is the overview about all the particles that have been seen. They all have been experimentally verified. But one particle is missing, and this is the clue. This is the famous Higgs particle. If you look at the model in detail, I, we can't go into these details, of course, but if you look into the model in detail, you need the Higgs particle because otherwise the model is mathematically inconsistent. Yeah, you find inconsistencies that can only be cured by the addition of this new particle, the Higgs particle. Yeah? And then we arrive at, well, I, I think I said it here, 
No, it's not exactly, yeah. What we call the standard model of particle physics. Uh, maybe it's a bit unlucky name. Yeah? If you buy a car, you never buy the standard model, you buy something better. But uh, this is how we call it, the standard model of particle physics. So the standard model of particle physics includes <coughs> six quarks, six leptons, all the force carriers here, plus the Higgs particle. Yeah? This is the standard model of particle physics. And it's named after one of its discoverers, Peter Higgs, 83 years old. And if we discover it, maybe this year, maybe next year, there's a good chance if he survives that he will receive the Nobel Prize. How to search for the Higgs particle? Well, this is why we built the LHC. And in the next talk, we will hear about this. Yeah, We will hear all, all the details. And well, I don't have to go into details here. But just as a little outlook, we built the LHC for more. Yeah, we want to learn how elementary particles obtain a mass. I will say a few words on this. Is there really a Higgs particle? Maybe are there, is there more than one Higgs particle? Do all these forces that I've shown you before, do they all unify at a certain energy scale to one force? Can we unify all to an even simpler picture that all the four forces become one force? Are there more than three dimensions of space-time? Is there something, I will say, maybe one word in the very end, what we call superspace, a very interesting concept. And finally, is it possible to produce dark matter? I will also say a word on this in the laboratory. Can we produce dark matter, a new form of matter in the LHC? Yeah, and the LHC might answer all these questions. But I think we will hear more about this on the next talk. So a few words on theoretical particle physics. I told you before that on the theory side, we search for models or what I call master formula that describes the world. And then we have to make predictions. We have to calculate masses of the elementary particles, or we have to calculate the probability that a particle is produced. We have this LHC, yeah, where we collide protons with protons. And then we can calculate how many Higgs particles should be produced every second, according to our model. And then the experimentalists, they perform all these nice experiments and they tell us whether the theorists are right or wrong. Yeah? And only with the comparison of the, of the theory and the experimental results, we can really find the true theory of nature. And this master formula that I was always mentioning so far, well, for the physicists among you, you might know this word, it's called a Lagrangian or Lagrange function. And this, it, it's a kind of, well, I will show you one. It's a kind of function that contains all the particles and all the interactions, all the forests between those, yeah? And how do you can write down, how can you invent such a Lagrangian? Well, there are some symmetry principles that might help you. As I said, you have to include all the experimental data. You have to include all the particles that you know that are there and they should be described. And of course, it should be simple. Yeah, it shouldn't be too complicated for no reason. And there's always experience and intuition involved. And the current best master formula that describes our whole world, that describes the standard model, yeah, in a very oversimplified version, it looks like this. Where you have, for example, here, a photon and two metaparticles, yeah, F and the antiparticle F bar. And they are coupled together in this Lagrangian with a constant described here. This is <coughs> a very simple form how to write it down. And we have similar groups of particles always with a coupling, what we call a coupling in front, uh, here for the Z and two metaparticles, or the W and two metaparticles, or a gluon, which couples here to two quarks. And of course, the Higgs must be part of the standard model Lagrangian, otherwise it's not consistent. And here in the second line, one can see what the Higgs does for us. The Higgs creates the masses of all the other elementary particles. And here, for example, we can see the Higgs with an H couples to two metaparticles. And in the way it does it, it also creates a mass for these metaparticles. I will not go into details here, but this is how theorists write it down. And it's not only, you can not only write it down, but you can use this formula to make calculations. But as I said, this is an oversimplified formula. 
The full one I have here on my T-shirt. So if you see me later over coffee break, want to take a look, I can explain you all the things that you see or that there are. The first two lines are the things that we know for sure, and the lower two lines are for the Higgs particle and its interaction. Yeah, but this is the master formula that describes our world. Fits on one T-shirt. This, this Lagrangian, this master formula, can be translated into particle physics processes. You can take these building blocks of this formula and describe a process. For example, you take this part with a gluon and two quarks here and here, and then you take this part with two quarks and the Higgs particle, and then you can construct this process. You start with two gluons, and in the end you produce a Higgs boson. Yeah, it's like a timeline. From here to here, you take two gluons and you produce a Higgs boson. And all these building blocks, this one, this one, this one, you find in the master formula here and, for example, uh, here. Or you take two quarks and you produce a Higgs particle and two more quarks. And then the Higgs doesn't live forever. It also disintegrates rapidly. Here, for example, the Higgs couples to two of these force particles to two W bosons, and then the W bosons to a photon, and then the Higgs can disintegrate into two light particles. And I show this because it's important, I think, for what might be said later on. And then these nice pictures that you can draw, they're equivalent to a mathematical formula. You can't see it here, but they're equivalent to a mathematical formula. And this formula, in the end, can be translated into numbers. And in this way, we can get we can calculate, really, from this formula the probability to produce a Higgs boson at the, at the LHC, if it exists. And this is just a matter of the probability. And you take here, you say Higgs boson weighs 100 in whatever unit this is. And then here, it tells you that this process has a probability of um, 25 in whatever units. But this can be done with this master formula. And finally, and this is maybe the last thing I will say, I told you, you have to compare theory and experiment. And now, with some experimental data from the LHC, you can try to compare this with what the theorists predict, how many Higgs bosons should we produce. Yeah? And this is one result here from one of the experiments that is done at the LHC. And what it does, it, it takes the um, measured number of Higgs particles and divides it by the prediction of our model. And if the model is correct, the, the, the division should result in one. Yeah? And so in the end, one gets this solid line with an uncertainty, of course. Yeah? No, no result is 100% precise. You always have an uncertainty. And one can see this is the one line. And here, the standard model, the formula that I have on my t-shirt, seems to give you the correct result for what we see at the LHC and what might be, what I hope will be told to you in the next talk. So there could be this famous Higgs particle, and maybe we are seeing it already. One minute, one minute, one minute. One little outlook. I told you the standard model fits on one t-shirt, but there are problems. There are some experimental results that cannot be explained with the standard model. Gravitation is not included. Yeah, the gravitational force, the fourth force is not included. We don't find that all the other three forces unify into one force. It doesn't work in the standard model. We know that there's dark matter in the universe. This has been measured by astrophysical experiments. The standard model does not explain this. It can't. And there are more theoretical arguments. Yeah? So we go to extended theories to extended master formulas that try to resolve these problems. And one very popular solution, it's called supersymmetry. It's just a name. It's another, it's an extension of what we know. But uh, here, for example, at our institute, we are working on the standard model and on supersymmetry. It's this nice acronym of SUSI. And just to give you one idea what happens in this model, here we have the standard model again, all the particles, the quarks, the electron, and the other leptons, all the force carriers, the Higgs particle. Here we have a few more Higgs particles. Nice, makes it maybe more interesting to search for them. And then all the particles 
have a brother particle or a sister particle, yeah, or a supersymmetric partner, which is, well, behaves the same, but has a, has a different mass, yeah? It's, it's more energetic and it's more difficult to produce. And the good thing is, as I said, here we not only have one Higgs particle in the same model, we have more, which might also be interesting for some uh, things to explain. And we have a dark matter particle, for example, yeah? This, this one thingy here. This ball is the dark matter particle and describes perfectly what we see in nature in the astrophysical observation. So this model is one of these candidates to go beyond this T-shirt formula to explain what goes on in our world. Thank you. <laughs>